Hey guys, welcome back to Moe's Game Table. Today I'm going to do a review of Soldiers and Postman's Uniforms. This is a game designed by David Thompson and will be published by Dan Burson Games. This is the latest in the Valiant Defense series from David Thompson, and it's yet another one of those lesser-known pieces of history. David finds, gamifies it, and turns it into a really challenging and very enjoyable game. The first one was Palov's House, the second was Castle Litter in the series. Both I've already covered on the channel. And that brings us to this third one here, Soldiers and Postman's Uniforms, which launches on Kickstarter on November 17th. If you're already familiar with the two that I mentioned, Pavlov's House and Castle Litter, you're going to feel right at home here with this one. If you're not, these are not difficult games to grok. They're really straightforward, easy to understand, and the rules walk you through all the steps of the game. So don't feel that this is something that's going to be above you. It's not. These are very approachable games. And the battle this game depicts took place at the very start of World War II when multiple attacks were staged against the Polish post office number one, which is this building here in Danzig, Poland. This is the overhead view of post office number one and then the different paths the Germans will take. On the right-hand side, you have the interior of the post office. All the locations inside are going to have different defenders in them, and they will be moving around doing different things throughout the course of the game. And the real attacks on the post office came in three different waves. This is represented by the three increasingly difficult decks of attack cards you have to go through. The end of the game is triggered by one of two things, either getting the fire engine card in the third deck, or if your morale goes down to zero. Morale is lost by taking casualties. Casualties will tell you how many points you lose, morale value-wise, and they're generally ones. There are a couple here that actually increase the value by one. These are leaders, though. They're commanders. You don't want to lose them unless you have to. Now, you may get in a situation where you have to make that tough choice where you're going to put them in a more vulnerable position because your morale's low. If you lose them, they're actually going to give you a boost of morale. So you're going to, that risk versus reward, do I want to risk this guy to try to get a little bit of a morale boost? But you might need to do that. You get down to one or two morale, you're really hanging on by your fingernails there. It might be worth taking that chance. The other three counters that are crucial to this game are the civilians. They are worth a total of seven morale points. There are three counters, two, two, and three are their values. So they're critical. You start with nine, you get down, you, you drop down seven, you're down to two, it, you're, you're almost over at that point. So what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you protect them. Likewise, not only are they crucial to staying in the game, but scoring-wise, in the escape phase and in the third deck of cards, you can get them out, you can score double the points. So 14 points is what they're worth to you from a victory point standpoint. To win the game, you need 16 points or greater. So you see how crucial those civilians are. This game follows the same color-coded line of sight we've seen in Pavlov's House and Castle Litter. If your colors match, you can see and potentially hit each other. That simple. Red sees red, white sees white, blue sees blue, so on and so forth. In the instance where you have two colors, Together, like blue and orange here, blue and orange can see this space, and this can see blue and orange. Again, really simple. When it comes to attack, you have your combat value on your counter. You look at it, it's generally going to be a one or two. It'll tell you how many dice you roll. So say we have a two combat value, we roll two dice. We're shooting at a target out here that has a defense of four. You roll two dice, you try to meet or beat four. Simple as that. Four, five, or six will take that target out. Now, when the attackers are attacking the defenders, they're not going to be attacking a defense value on the counter. They're going to be attacking the defense value of the location. Obviously, the basement's going to be tougher than the ground floor. Ground floor is going to be tougher than the upper floor. And that's something you're going to kind of take for granted until you get into that second deck of uh, attack cards. And that's where you'll be facing the infantry guns. They really suck. <laughs> we'll talk about those here in a minute. But overall, easy peasy, very effective rules here for attack defense and line of sight that keeps the gameplay straightforward and constantly progressing. There's no need to do any mental gymnastics to understand line of sight uh, that we see in other tactical games, reading tons of pages of, of rules. I think this is fantastic because it really expands the appeal to non-war gamers as well as war gamers. It gives great crossover value. For people looking to try this type of game that don't generally play, play war games, you can jump into this without any problems. So don't feel intimidated at all. Then when we get into the attack decks, the first one is going to give you threats that are going to be primarily in blue and the white areas. And it's predominantly infantry. There are a couple machine guns that are going to be in there as well. This allows you to narrow your defense concern to these areas specifically, and it feels pretty manageable. And it generally is. Where it starts getting interesting is if at the end of the turn, when you run out of cards for your deck, if you have a leader and 
if somebody has an assaulter has gotten inside the building, guess what? That deck is not over. You don't get this auto magic restart. You've got to continue on by shuffling up the deck and you need to eliminate the assaulter or the leader. Once that happens, then you can continue on to the next deck. So that's pretty cool. But once you get to that second deck, that's when things get grim pretty quickly. Uh, all avenues of approach are now in play. You've got the red as well as the blue and white. And that means you got to expand your scope of defense. On top of that, you're not just facing your standard infantry, but you're also having to handle heavy support weapons, infantry guns, howitzers, vehicles, and the tougher SS troops that come up in the third deck. Now, I'd mentioned about the infantry guns a little bit ago. These things are really nasty. And that's because, like other units out here are attacking a location, they're going to determine a location, they're going to see what's inside it, they're going to attack it. The infantry guns attack the entire floor, <laughs> which really sucks, which is what their function is. Come in there and just destroy the defenses and try to whittle down those walls and hammer at everybody inside. The problem is they attack those walls, but they can also, if they get a successful attack through, they can also disrupt everyone on that floor in one shot. So that's what I'm saying. That's a really, really tough weapon that you're going to want to concentrate on when it's out there. And this, as I said, makes the decisions a lot more tough because your threats are more spread out, not to mention far more deadly, like we we're talking about with the infantry gun here a moment ago. And this really clamps that pressure down on you considerably. You have limited actions to begin with, it, and that means that you have a lot harder time not only dealing with the threats, but also as you're getting ready to go into the third deck, setting up the escape chain to get your civilians out of there, as well as any other survivors, uh, defenders that you can get out to be survivors and count towards your victory points. You get into that third deck, I just mentioned the escape phase. That's the new phase that comes into play in the third deck. Eligible defenders that are near entrance spaces that are other than at the front. You can't get out the front. That's a no-go zone. Uh, you have to have a complete clear line of sight, meaning there's no assaulters down that path that you're on, uh, nor support weapons on that colored path. Then you can just run for your lives and exit off the map. When they do get off the map, keep those on the side because you're going to need to count them up later. But this is, again, like I said, it makes the decisions tougher here because you've got to deal with that infantry gun. You've got to deal with increasingly more difficult troops, other support weapons, howitzers, things like that. And you're trying to clear a path so you can get people out of there. So it, with only four actions, it's really a really tough road to hoe, and it's a lot of fun. This game really does put a squeeze on you, and it builds a great deal of tension as the attack pressure increases with each deck. I really like how that works. I especially dig how moving on to the next deck is contingent upon ensuring there are no leaders out on the board, nor assaulters in the building. And that, that is really a cool way of putting the pressure and, and forcing you to deal with the immediate threats just like you would do in the real world. You don't get that magic refresh when those guys are in there. You got to deal with them and I think that's a pretty cool way of doing it. And when it comes to feeling the squeeze and attention, this is due to the way that the decks are balanced. David does another solid job with this game in following a similar formula he has in the other games where the threat is always real but it doesn't go boss level on you right out of the gate. Because if it did, game would be just over immediately and there's no point. Instead, it's almost like a slow burn. You, oh yeah, I can handle this situation. Yeah, okay, man, things are getting a little more interesting. And then, wow, this is rapidly getting out of hand. That is a cool thing about the way these decks work. And of course, obviously, it comes down to how well your die rolls are, if you can eliminate threats and get your suppression out there, things like that. But I really like how the decks do build that up on you and it helps drive that narrative forward. It's really, really great fun. And where that narrative is nicely illustrated is with these barricades. I didn't mention these before, but there are four different barricades out there. These guys will come up there and they'll get to the barricade. Once they get to the barricade, then you have the grenade bundle that gets shuffled into the deck. Now, depending on where it goes in the deck, it could come up right away. It can come up later. If it comes up later, that's great because the barricade is not broken through yet, but these guys keep stacking. Next thing you know is you got a big stack of guys here. Once that grenade card comes out and they blow that barricade, they're going to come pouring through pretty fast. So it's something you got to keep track of and you got to be watching that while you're watching other threats. But I really think it's it's just another point of concern that you're going to be observing with apprehension because you know that when that dam breaks, those troops are going to come pouring through in quick order. So those barricades are something you really 
got to be mindful of along with everything else. Just another one of the aspects of the game that keeps you concerned and keeps you paying attention and keeps you on your toes. And having the threat avenues expand is another cool aspect of the game. I like how in the first deck it's just blue and white, but then when you get in the second, it expands out to the red. So now you have a greater threat vector to, to concern yourself with. The Valiant Defense series of games, I think it has real fantastic replay value because the randomness of the, of the deck ensures that you can't come up with a killer strategy that will always win you the game. Despite your best efforts, you'll oftentimes lose. That's just the way things go in this. Not only does that boost replayability, it also lets you sit back and really respect the courage and determination that was required by the individuals that are uh, represented in these games. I think that is something else that sometimes we forget when we're playing these games. When you play the game, you see how difficult it was. You're like, oh man, this game's tough, this game's tough. Just remember, there were people who faced this for real. And I think that's a pretty sobering thought. If you're just a solo gamer, you're going to really love this. And if you have been curious about tactical games, but you're intimidated, you're like, ah, I don't know if I could do war games. The color-coded line of sight makes it very easy to grok. So don't fear that. Jump right into this game and you can get into it very, very easily. It's a very straightforward game. The rules are real easy to understand and everything's explained out to you very simply. And David supports his games really well on BGG. So if you have any questions, you'll get answers there uh, without a doubt. I'm going to include a link to the draft rules at the bottom of the video. So uh, go there, get the rule book. If you're not familiar with the, with the game series, go get that rule book. You can read through it and you'll see what I'm saying. This is a very straightforward series, very straightforward game to get into, but it does, it's going to suck you in for the challenge and the narrative. Definitely enjoy this series quite a bit. But overall, I think this is yet another winner for David Thompson. He just continues to run out a string of really competent and easily approachable games that are just damn fun to play. The guy really just keeps knocking out of the park, and I love it because we're happy to keep playing these games. Well, I hope that helps you guys out if you'd be curious about this one. If you have any comments or questions, post them down below. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next time.